So in this video, I am going to be explaining the skills and passions in the rule set of Mithras. So get on that horse, grab those percentile dice and let's roll. My name's Inwells and welcome to the In Crowd. As always, if you are enjoying these videos, then please like, comment or subscribe to the channel. In doing so, you will not only get receive notifications when the next video is uploaded, but you will also be supporting both the channel and my dream. And if anybody can tell me what these things are up here, then it would be absolutely fantastic because I have no idea what they do. So if you want to jump over a trap in the corridor or if you want to figure out whether or not that guard is really telling you the truth or not, or you want to understand the customs or value the most recent piece of expensive jewelry that you found in a treasure hoard. Well, if you want to do any of these things, then you need to know how to operate the skills in Mithras. So within Mithras, there are two sorts of skills, either standard skills or professional skills. Now, standard skills are those skills that everybody has. Now, some people might be able to do this better or worse than other people, depending where they have put their points in character generation or where they have improved their, their skills as the campaign progresses. Standard skills involve skills such as athletics, which covers running, climbing, jumping, or maybe another physical skill like brawn or endurance. And But they also include um, mental skills such as influence, insight and willpower. Now, just so you know, combat styles are also classed as standard skills, but are treated differently throughout the rules. Now, if you would like to see how combat actually works in Mithras, then I'll stick a link into the card up above. Now, professional skills are skills which are developed um, in, during character generation and are actually dependent on the char character's culture or professional background choices. These can differ from character to character and some have several different sorts of focuses. For example, there is a professional skill called craft, but a character would not just take craft by itself. What they would do is specialize in it. So, for example, they might have craft alchemy or craft blacksmithing. And so it would change according to their um, specialism. Other spe um, professional skills include things like survival, tracking, commerce and gambling. Um, but the other thing to remember is that all the magical skills are also professional skills as well. So really and truly throughout character generation, if you want to have magic, then you're going to have to choose a profession that actually would give the character these skills. If you're interested in magic, then there's a little card up above here somewhere that will explain magic to you. So the base chance of success of any skill is determined by adding together two characteristics or multiplying one characteristic by two. For example, athletics, a standard skill, is actually the base chance for that is calculated by adding your strength and your dexterity together. Insight, uh, more of a mental standard skill, is calculated by adding your intelligence and power together. While law, which of course would be um, further specialised, for example, law in monsters, that is calculated by taking your in intelligent characteristic and multiplying it by two. This will give you the base chance of success in that skill. Um, this can change, of course, and you can up it by adding skills in character generation or by using improvement roles um, throughout the campaign. More about that later on. So if you're interested, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you'll get a notification when that video becomes available. So when a character rolls to see whether or not they have been successful in their skill, they roll a percentile dice, a 1d100, which will generate a number between 0, 1 
up to 100. Basically, if they score their skill rating or less, then the skill has been successful. If they roll higher than their skill rating, then the the skill has been unsuccessful and they wouldn't get any benefit or reward from it. Now, the other thing to remember is that if somebody rolls between 1% and 5%, then the skill is always successful, no matter what the difficulty grade is or the modifiers or anything like that. However, if they roll between 96 and 100, then the skill always fails. Okay, again, despite their actual skill roll. Now, on top of that, if a character rolls one tenth or less than their skill, then they will be awarded a critical success. So what this means is that if I have a skill of 80%, if I roll between 0, 1 and 0, 8, I will be rewarded a critical success. Now, at the other end of the scale, if a character rolls 99 or 100, then that is classed as a fumble. So remember, 96 to, to 100 fails, but 99 to 100 is a special sort of fail, which is a fumble. However, if a character's skill level is greater than 100, so say, for example, I've worked really hard on my athletics and now my skill chance, um, my skill in athletics is 110, then I will only fumble if I roll a 100, okay? However, still any roll between 96 and 100 would be a fail. Hopefully, you are still with me because there's another aspect of skill rolling that we need to include. Sometimes the difficulty of the skill changes, making the skill either easier or harder to succeed. At a standard roll, the, the difficulty grade is standard. So that would imply that if I had a, a skill roll um, rating of 60, I would have to get 60% or below. For example, let's say there's a gap um, in a dungeon corridor or in the plane somewhere and I want to jump over that gap. So if my athletics is, uh, my skills in athletics is 60%, then I would have to roll 60% or less in order to be successful. However, if there was a strong headwind that is making that jump difficult, then the difficulty grading would be increased. So rather than just being a standard roll, it would now be a hard roll. Now, what this means is that if the skill roll is a difficulty grade of hard, then the total skill of the character is reduced by one third of the um, skill um, rating. So if I was had a skill of 60% in athletics, it's a hard roll, so I have to reduce my 60% skill by one third. So one third of 60% would be 20%, so I would reduce my skill to 40%. So now, because the skill difficulty rating is hard, Instead of having to get 60 below, I now need to get 40 or below. So there are various defined difficulty grades in Mithras, and you can see them over there now. But notice, as well as making a skill harder, it can also make a skill easier easier. So say, for example, I'm jumping over that gap and somebody's going to give me a push or yank me across with the rope, then as a game master, I might say, right, this skill is now easy. Now, despite having a skill of 60%, because the difficulty grade is now easy, then I'm allowed to add one half of my skill onto my total roll. So instead of having only 60%, skill chance, I now have 90%, which is 60 plus half my skill roll, which is 90. Now, you can see, therefore, that skills can become harder or more difficult. 
Interesting with spells, you can actually say that um, instead of just casting them as quickly as you possibly can, normally in seconds, then you can actually take minutes or hours to cast a spell. And if you take minutes, instead of a standard skill roll, this skill roll will become easy. And hours, some kind of ritual magic, then the skill success, the difficulty rating, sorry, will become very easy. Of course, it works the other way as well. And sometimes due to fatigue, then you can be facing hard roles or formidable roles, which makes succeeding extremely difficult. Now, of course, there are times when there are special cases or special situations that occur within the game that has a certain impact on skill roles. One of these is when a character wishes to reattempt the role. For example, as a last ditch attempt or something like that. Now, it's totally up to the game master whether or not he or she allows this. But basically what the rules say is that it can happen, but if it does occur, then you would increase the difficulty grade by one. This is not used in my campaign for things like combat or spell casting. It's only if they're using either a, a skill that, for example, trying to find information or influencing somebody or something like that. Another special occasion or special skill role is called the augmented skill role. And I, as a GM, really like this idea. So sometimes what I will say, or I will agree with the character or the play if they suggest it to me, sometimes we allow a secondary skill to augment the primary skill. Now, when this happens, the player is allowed to add double the critical value or 20% because the critical is always 10% onto their second, their primary skill. So let's give you an example. Say, for example, from the campaign, Hazra, the outdoory nomad character, is using his stealth to crawl or to move through the undergrowth. Now, because Hazra is skilled in survival and understands, you know, how to survive outside or has a locale skill, I might say to him, right, because you're outside and this is your area that you work in, you can augment your stealth skill with your survival skill. So what this would mean, say, for example, his um, stealth skill was 50% and his survival is 60, I would say to him, you can add one um, one twentieth or double your crit. So that would be, what, 12% onto your stealth roll to make it easier for him to succeed. Now, in the same way that some skills can be used to augment other skills, some skills can also be used to cap the primary skill. So what this means is that the, the primary skill will be limited by another skill. So say for for example, in our campaign, Gulliver, who is the um, sorcerer who has a literacy skill and he's always finding out fresh pieces of information. Say, for example, he's in the library in his order searching for information about a new cult or brotherhood that the party are investigating. Gulliver's literacy skill could be, say, 80%. However, unbeknown to him, the actual information about this cult is not in his primary language. It's in a language that he only has 30% reading and writing in. Therefore, instead of rolling 80%, his literacy skill, he would still roll his percentile dice, but this time the literacy skill would be capped to 34%, which is the limit of his language of this new cult. And the final sort of like um, situation um, is a situation that occurs with, when the roles are contested. So imagine that two characters are trying to match the same role or opposing roles. For example, if two people are trying to arm wrestle, then it will be brawn skill against brawn skill. If somebody is trying to influence somebody and somebody is trying to deceive somebody, then it will be influence against 
um, deceive. Now, in these cases, both skills are rolled and the level of success is actually matched. Now, when we say the level of success, we mean either a critical standard or fumble. OK, so, for example, if um, Gulliver and Bartleby are having an arm wrestle, uh, which is probably very unlikely knowing both their characters, but if they were having a brawn wrestle, uh, arm wrestle, then we would they would both roll brawn. Now, say for example, Gulliver scored a critical and Bartleby scored a standard roll, then Gulliver would win. And if Gulliver, um, if Bartleby say rolled a, s a standard roll, but um, Gulliver fumbled, then or failed, then Bartleby would win. Now, if they both rolled the same success, i.e. they both succeeded or they both rolled a critical or they both fumbled, then the person with the highest score within that success would win. OK, so somebody with um, a score of 60 is more has more chance of winning than a somebody with a score of 20. Now, there is, there is one other type of skill that characters can have in Mithras that are, is, are neither, it's neither a standard skill or a professional skill. And this skill is called a passion. Now, a passion is normally created when the um, character is first created or the characters can develop these as they join in the campaign and interact with people. A passion is something, a skill level, that the character is literally passionate about. So, for example, Gulliver has a passion for cheese. Hengis has a passion against the double-headed snake cult that actually abducted his sister. And Hasra, after the last brilliant session, and if you haven't caught that, then please do check it out, Hasra will be gaining a passion to do with last man standing or bra being brave and courageous. Now, the initial rating of this passion depends on what the passion is about. For example, if the passion is against a, a specific person, then the initial skill is 30% plus the power of the character and the charisma of the opposing character. Now, these vary, but you can see that over there, there's a table that sort of like gives you the rough ideas of these. Now, you might be asking, so how do passions impact on gameplay? Well, a passion acts as a skill that can augment a primary skill. So remember, it's going to augment it by double the critical rating or by 20%. So for example, say for example, Gulliver is, who has a commerce skill, is trying to buy, sell or evaluate some cheeses. Now, say, for example, he is buying some cheese, then he would roll his commerce skill normally and have to get that skill or less. However, the skill rating or less, sorry. However, because he can augment it with his cheese passion, he will be able to add 20% of his cheese passion onto his commerce skill, making it that he is better at buying and selling or evaluating cheese. Now, as Hazra um, progresses through the campaign now, he has a passion um, for bravery or last man standing or something similar. I forget what he's actually going to call it. But because he's had that, uh, he's got that passion. As he stands there, fighting alone at the last moment again, instead of just rolling his combat skill, he can now augment it with his passion of being brave and courageous, which actually will make him um, be a lot more successful. Now, passions are optional, but as a GM, I really do think that they add depth to characters. I must also say that I either suggest it to the characters or the players throughout the game, or in many cases, they will say to me, would I be able to augment this with my passion? And I'll make a decision there and then. So that's it. Hopefully you now have a bit of an understanding 
of how skills work in the Mithras rule set. Although it sounds a little bit complicated to start off with, I would suggest you just take your time with it, start off without augmenting or contesting, and get used to the skill roles, and then bring in the other aspects as you progress. Pretty soon, the characters will, the player, sorry, will be suggesting skills that they might want to roll, i.e. can I roll my lore monsters to find out more about that, or using, uh, suggesting passions how their passion could be implemented. For example, is it all right to augment my um, my skill with my passion because I'm completely devoted to my deity? Now, coming up in future videos, I'm going to be looking more in depth in the different magic disciplines. There has been one video about this already, which you can probably see up there somewhere. But we're going to have a bit of an interview or uh, some contribution to the people who actually by the people who actually play that magic class in the campaign. I'm also going to do a video about character generation, how to improve as you go through um, Mithras games, and also how I create um, adventures. So if you are looking forward to any of those, then please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And if you press that bell button, you will get a notification when I go live. Now, just to say that I will be uploading a new video every Wednesday. It might be about Mithras, it might be about something else. So I hope you enjoy the diversity of the challenge. And as always, a challenge channel, sorry. As always, if you have any questions, then please add them in the comments below and I will try my best to answer them. So until next time, can I please remind you to be who you are and say what you think? Because the people who mind don't matter and the people who matter don't mind. Have fun and I'll catch you all later. And until then, happy role playing and make every one of your passions count. See ya.